All right. Okay. So what we want to talk to, to you all today about is progressive delivery and, and specifically how how the kind of the concept of delivery has 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 been dramatically enabled by technology over over the last sort of couple of years. And, and it's you know it's it's a completely different landscape from when I was deploying um, software applications into production just you know four years ago before I, I joined HashiCorp as a as a developer advocate. So progressive delivery. But um, I mean, Zan, Zan's going to start us off. We're going we're to kind of, I think, start through with a little bit of a story about why this came about. Yeah. Hello. So our story begins with the tool called Cloud Native Translate, or Cloud Nate Translate, as I and Nick like to call it. So this is an app we wanted to build for our global audience, and essentially it lets you make translations from any language into any other language. So we're making the communication over the internet truly a global thing and uh, accessible to all everywhere. And such an inno innovative app this is, right? So yeah, we were working on this app. We developed it and we deployed it. We had, a, we had, we had an MVP running, it was pretty good. It translated everything from English into Slovenian. So as, as 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 usable as you might uh, uh, imagine this might be um and uh, as we're like really following the best practices we were good cloud native citizens we had a lot of automation set up for kind of deployment pipeline was all kind of in, in a great shape and we had automated tests to kind of make sure that our software was always working and uh, our ci would always run them, which is also great. But yes, despite that all the tests we had, we still ended up with a broken application in production. And this was actually a particularly bad way because our users were seeing errors and our translation app most certainly did not translate. And this is the tale of this application and what went wrong and how we improved our deployment pipelines and lives in the process. So it was a pretty sort of standard process. You know, we, we were, we were working on the code base. So we, we started off taking this JavaScript um, API and just adding this multilingual lingual support to it, you know, very, very standard sort of Git flow approach, change the code. We, we run our tests because we, we, you know, we have unit tests and, and all sorts of things like that. And then obviously the looking at the the sort of the the next steps on that, you you do what you do, which is you, you know, you push it um into into GitHub and 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 create a, a PR from that. So once the code is committed and pushed to GitHub, then this is then picked up by our CI CD tool, which is uh, Circle CI for us. And this essentially runs our continuous integration or CI pipeline. This builds our app runs all the tests that we have and after they all pass. So they all pass for us, so all good here. And this is great because we don't really have to rely on running these tests locally on our developer machines. We kind of offload this to a nicely scripted and safe and reproducible environment in the cloud. It's all, everything is automated. And uh, all we need to do now is go to GitHub and uh, Show the next slide, please. Yes, you go to GitHub and uh, we're about to merge our pull request here, which essentially puts our branch work into the into the main, which, uh, which we let Nick do. And uh, once Nick, ma Nick made that merge, our CI CD kicked in again, but this time the CD part as well, which is the deployment pipeline. And note that we see Nick's avatar is showing here that he was the one who merged this and uh, made the commit and uh, did all the all the work. And uh, this will also uh, come very in handy into when, when things go truly sideways. So yeah, our deployment pipeline is similar to the one you saw earlier, which was uh, just a CI build. So building and testing, this would also kind of push this thing over to our Kubernetes cluster, which is which is where we're kind of running it in production. 
And then then it all went wrong because actually what we started to see from the logs was a, a, an, an elevated level of 500 errors coming from the API server. Immediately, we'd gone from something which was very stable and had been for a long time to something that every request was, was failing. So of course, you go into that kind of usual, usual process of, oh dear, we need to fix this. Everybody's running around offering help. The pointy head boss is sort of coming over asking what we can do. We tell the pointy head boss, please just you know, go and go and sit quietly over there and, and kind of leave us, leave us be to fix this. The pointy head boss then takes offense at that. Then you've got to deal with two problems, a broken build and an offended boss. But ultimately, you, you kind of get through the process of let's start to, to do the diagnostics and debug where this is going wrong. And wrong, it was really going. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is not what you want your translation app to look like when you wanted to make translations, by the way. Essentially, this is the, uh, this is the kind of bugs that our end users uh, ended up seeing. And uh, to understand why, we had to look through the, through the logs. And our logs would essentially tell us a story. And the, the problem existed between keyboard and chair. So essentially, we added this new languages feature, which uh, obviously let us translate into many new languages. And uh, it was crashing because languages uh, didn't exist, which meant, well, actually, this variable was undefined at the time of us needing it. So yeah, logs are great because they tell us a story, but only after that happens. But we had a bunch of tests to that should really pick it up before we brought down production, right? And for some reason, the tests didn't. I mean, we, we, we blatantly had coverage to make sure that the language was being set correctly. Um, and we were running them, and we were being great citizens, but sadly, we, we took the site offline. So yeah, in our case, we did have a code problem, but not all problems are always related to application code. Um, they can actually exist in many parts of your, well, actually in all parts of your software uh, delivery lifecycle. For example, your infrastructure might change. Uh, what you're running, the, the physical hardware that you're running or your software might change, or you might introduce uh, an upgraded dependency, which brings a slightly changed behavior or kind of down the line it has a dependency that breaks something or has a or, or has a or has a bug bugs happen obviously and uh, that can happen or there are also scenarios where your tests don't really work that well and one example is um where you don't have plan where you haven't planned for the scenarios and that obviously means that you don't have tests for it so example, the scale that you're thinking about, uh, your application might operate, might change, or maybe you're seeing spikes in usage that you really haven't foreseen. And uh, maybe there is a change in like shift in the payload pattern, what your users are actually sending or like using your app for. So for example, they might be sending you text to translate, but uh, you didn't really anticipate the encodings that they used because everyone uses ASCII, right? So yeah, for when these tests don't really work as we hoped, we proposed the following solution. My name is Zan and uh, I'm a developer advocate at CircleCI. I'm Nick Jackson. I work as a, a developer advocate at, at HashiCorp and or, or allegedly Circle CI, if, if you look at my email, but I might be moonlighting. Or well, that could just be a mistake on the slide. <laughs> um, yeah, our Twitters are beneath, so follow us. Anyway, this leads us to the topic of our talks today, which is progressive delivery. So let's look at how this looks like uh, at, a, at a broad uh, scale. So this is a process which brings together uh, continuous integration, monitoring, and fancy traffic routing patterns that allows you to deploy your applications into production in a safe manner. Roughly, it uh, consists of uh, five steps. 
So we start with code, we're writing code, we're merging code, we're doing the, the committing and all that stuff. And then we deploy that code and we operate and run this code and also monitor and then do the routing with. And the fact is that the code part is the only manual step of the process. Everything else we can automate, which is great. And, uh, and uh, the tools we're using, we're offloading this automation to. Uh, we mentioned a few of them already. So CircleCI, but also Kubernetes and, uh, and Flagger for monitoring and uh, Console for, uh, for uh, the service mesh for all the routing magic. So that's what we'll be covering today. So there's also two patterns we want to cover. So canary is the first one of those. The idea is to split your traffic between two running, two deployed running instances of the app or API in our case. So primary is the one we already have in production. And uh, then at the same time, we also deploy the new version, which is the canary. So we both Run, we run both simultaneously and we aggregate the metrics uh, from both. Uh, so we then compare them and uh, have our application decide on what to do. The other pattern is called uh, retry and it does what it says on the tin. So our, if our monitoring shows that we're about to serve errors to the user, so let's say a user uh, sends a post or get request to our API, if our... Um, if our app hits the canary and that uh, uh, holds a bug, then, uh, or that would crash essentially the application as it was in our case, um, this would essentially retry the same request uh, behind the scenes before that kind of 500 failure response reaches the user. And hopefully this will end up uh, hitting our primary API, the, the one that's already stable. So, uh, so that's the canary pattern. And the high level process is just that, like you, you push some bugs, you don't catch those bugs because your uh, tests haven't thought about everything, you haven't thought about everything in your tests. And uh, as you're running two versions of the app in the, in the simultaneously, you're then kind of on one hand, serving only the successful responses to the users. And on the other hand, you're, uh, you're monitoring how your canary performs compared to the, to the primary, to, to the old code in production. And depending on the result of that kind of comparison uh, when, when you're monitoring it, you're either promoting the canary into, into the production. So it becomes the new production or you're discarding and rolling back the changes because you know it's not really working. And the total workflow is this. And if you're not horrified by the, the, the kind of the concept of this, then you're, you're not human because there's a lot of moving parts. But I think the key thing is that software is delivering the bulk of, of this work. The, the main sort of involvement, once you've got everything set up as, a, as an individual sort of either operating or pushing code is really just that standard VCS approach. So the way that, that this works is that you, you write code, you're gonna commit some code, you push that code to GitHub, CircleCI builds your code, and it also executes your tests. If the tests are passing in the build, is satisfied, so you, you know, you're gonna get that sort of GitHub thing, all the, all the checks are passing. You can then raise a PR. You raise a PR, PR is merged after a code review. You go back into that sort of build, um, just quick sanity check, and then you deploy the code. Now, when you're deploying the code, what we're doing is we're literally just using a Kubernetes deployment. Well, we're actually using Customize to, to be able to give us some, some um, dynamism around a deployment, but it's predominantly just a Kubernetes deployment. So the, the deployment hits Kubernetes and it gets scheduled. Now Flagger, Flagger is listening to that. So what Flagger does is it detects that there's a change in, in the deployment. And Flagger then will, will start to modify the traffic routing using console service mesh. 
Because the way that things work with console service mesh is all of your traffic between all of your services are flowing through the service mesh. They're intercepted by the data plane or the proxy before they hit your destination. So it means that the service mesh can take con complete control over what the, the shape of the traffic looks like and to where it, it goes. So we create a service splitter. Flagger is doing that automatically for us. It then starts to monitor the metrics. So Flagger is looking at the, the metrics from, from our application in Prometheus or Datadog or whatever you use as a, um, as, as, as a kind of a metric store. And then it started like trying to infer some information about that. If the metric meets your required standard, so if there are a, a number of errors which are acceptable to you or, or no errors at all, then what it can do is it can start to keep increasing the percentage of traffic that goes through to the traffic splitter. So you start low, start at 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever, you know, and keep going up. Because as we mentioned earlier on, Sometimes bugs only manifest at a particular level of traffic. You can push, if you just push stuff into production and you give it a couple of quick refreshes or you, you're running very low levels of traffic through it, you can, it can behave correctly. But maybe when you hit a particular volume of traffic on the service, you start to run into issues. It could be like a mutex, a database lock or something like that, you know, sort of. But anyway, Flagger is monitoring that. In the instance that everything's okay, it continues to roll it up. In the instance that it fails, it's going to automatically roll back the deployment for you, resetting all of the, 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 the sort of the traffic routing back to the primary. So it's, it's completely safe. And as long as you've got an item potent request, a request which can be submitted multiple times without sort of multiple change, then you can use the retry that we mentioned earlier to completely hide the fact that there's a problem in your system from your end user. Doesn't mean the problem isn't there, but it means you've got time to fix the problem. And we're going to kind of show you this whole process. And it all starts with the code. So what we do is we're going to write the code, we're going to commit the code, we're going to raise a PR, and we're going to merge the code. And I'm going to try and do this live because I am literally a glutton for punishment. So this is my 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 currently running code in production. Now the problem with this code is that I'm not I'm a Go developer. I'm not actually a JavaScript developer. And it was only when um, I'd been going through this, this investigation that I realized that you've got this async await thing and that stuff um, doesn't necessarily happen in a, in a standard linear fashion. So even though we, our unit tests were checking that we were setting the languages, we weren't checking it truly in, a, in an asynchronous nature. So we had bad tests, like 100% our fault, okay? but. What I need, we need this get languages is returning asynchronously. So what's happening is we're setting up the translation handler with a null object because we haven't waited for get languages to return. So let's um, let's just sort of uh, you know, box box that up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a uh, an async function. Um, I'm going to call it fetch languages. And inside of fetch languages, I'm literally just going to do my, um, my fetch. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the keyword await so that I can, I can ensure that I'm not returning languages before that promise is completed inside my JavaScript there. And then what I can do is in my, my kind of main setup for for my application. Again, I can just put this in another async function. And we're just going to call this setup. Set up with a P. Because I can't type ever. And we're just going to put that in there like that. And we've got another async function. I'm just going to indent that because I've got OCD. Okay. So now Everything's going to kind of work um, fine here. What we can do is we can call const langs and we're going to do um, await fetch languages. And now everything should execute asynchronously. So let's just, before I forget, call our setup at the bottom of our um, 
index.js file here. But this now should, should work and, and everything should be, should be fine. So again, usual, uh, usual kind of process run my git status, of course, oh, of course, sorry. Run my tests, tests are passing, or both of them. Add it. And I'm just gonna commit this, fix nasty a sync bug. I push that. And then I go over to my web browser and I'm going to raise a PR, which is then going to kick off the Circle CI build. So let's go github.com, cloud native translate, um, compare and PR. I'm going to create the PR there. Can you zoom a bit, Nick, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't have this page already pre zoomed. There we go. So this is, this is prepared. If we look here, we got the circle checks going and we're running the, the first part of our, um, of our deployment. So whilst this is running, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna cut a corner for the sake of, of brevity and I'm just gonna merge this. So we'll come back to this later, just Pretend I didn't do that, but I don't want you to have to wait around whilst we, we kind of discuss more about what's going on here. Yeah. So obviously once Nick has merged the, uh, the changes, this kicks off our uh, deployment step. And if you move to yeah, Visual Studio, now let's see if this remote uh, magic works. So our Circle CI uh, pipeline, CI/CD pipeline, is um, is defined in this config.yaml file, uh, which is in this dot Circle CI uh, folder at the top level of your uh, repository, and that's where that's where everything is defined. What needs to happen? And in this file, we have a couple of things, or actually three interesting things. One is orbs, and jobs, and workflows. So jobs are essentially a collection of, uh, of steps that execute in a given environment. So for example, our job called build Docker uh, executes in a Docker environment. And uh, these are the steps it does. And these steps, they can be things like uh, kind of CI instructions, like checkout, which kind of checks out the, the code at, a, at a, this given commit, or uh, they can be like run instructions. So any kind of bash uh, command line uh, in kind of instruction or program you can, you can run or they can be these uh, fancy docker slash build, docker slash step, the check or discord slash status, kind of uh, higher level commands that are, uh, you, can, you can actually define those as, as commands in, in this config, or you can actually pull them from these things called orbs, uh, which are collections of uh, this config that are that is shareable that you don't have to like reinvent the wheel. For example, Docker builds are Docker builds and node tests are node tests, regardless of where they're where they're writing it. So, uh, or where you're writing them or where you're using them. So you don't have to like re reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, the way our kind of build Docker and uh, create deployment jobs are orchestrated is in this thing called workflow, which is essentially uh, a place where you arrange your jobs. For example, we want this node test job to run, which again comes from this uh, node orb. So you don't really have to tell it anything. You just 
give it a node version and that's what it's going to do it's going to run in this uh, in an environment that has this node version installed um then obviously we want to run the build docker uh image which kind of requires a node test you can tell it okay these these jobs are kind of uh, kind of requirement for the, this latter one to continue. For example, you want to run your tests first and then do any kind of builds or deployment. After which we go into the deployment uh, stage. And you might notice that for one, we're, we're doing this only on the main branch. So it didn't, it didn't trigger this deployment uh, pipeline uh, portion unless we merge this into the main branch. So you kind of have, this is your CI part, which is the continuously degrading, just verifying that everything builds, all the tests are working, everything is, is, is fine. And then we're obviously um, jumping into this uh, deployment uh, workflow, which first we have to, we have this approval step, which is like a manual thing saying, okay, is this really what you want to do? Yes, you have to click. Yes, I want to approve this deployment, kind of continue. And then we're going into create update deployment, which is uh, does all the GKE and Kubernetes work. So Nick mentioned this uh, customized thing. So I suppose uh, we can talk about this a little bit uh, now. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got like a, a pretty standard sort of setup here. As I say, we're, we're going through it, we're preparing everything, we're setting everything up. And the nice thing about this is it's very, very reusable. A lot of things take sort of a little bit of a while to, to get set up the first time, but a lot of these steps are, are very, very, very reusable. I tend to use very, very similar things across all of my, my setup. This, um, this step where, that we're looking at next is, is the deployment step. So in the deployment step, what we're going to be doing is we want to be updating that deployment and we want to be pushing that notification to so Flagger can set it up. So how we do the deployment is, 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 is again, very standard. Um, it's just kind of Kubernetes setup. So let's have a look at our application first. So our application is just a standard Kubernetes um, service here. Now the service is, is because we're using um, the Prometheus operator and we're using service monitors. So we, we just wanna tell Prometheus that it, it needs to scrape metrics from, from this application service. And then we have a standard Kubernetes deployment and there is literally, even though this is gonna be part of the service mesh, there is nothing different in this deployment apart from these two lines here. And these two annotations, what they do is the, the, the controller that works with console service mesh will, will automatically create this. It picks it up as a mutating webhook and it will modify my deployment and it's gonna add all of the, the service mesh data plane and the various authentication pieces which are needed in order for this pod to, to take part in the service mesh. But you know, I don't have to configure anything different. I've just got my, my standard API, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Rather than having to like dynamically write this file every time we want to do a deployment to add the, the tag or the SHA, in, in our instance, what we're doing is we're using customize. So we're just using a very simple customization script rather than um, applying these configuration files. We're defining which resources we want to deploy, and we're just going to be doing this simple replacement. So we're changing the tag. Whenever you find the image translate API, and we're just we're using the uh, the circle SHA for, for all of our all of our images, and that's that's all that's needed around the the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes now pushes that deployment. It's time for Flagger to take over. So let's have a look at how how Flagger um, is configured and how Flagger works. So again, Flagger is is sitting uh, in as a, as a controller. It's it's monitoring any of the the of your deployments and the way you tell it which which deployment to to monitor is by using this um this uh crd definition here so what um what i'm doing is i'm defining a canary i'm specifying just name metadata standard coop stuff and then the target so i i'm saying i want you to monitor the api the deployment a deployment called api 
then you can set some some various sort of settings. Um, here I'm setting 600 seconds. If there's an instance, it will continue to try and monitor errors for 600 seconds before it rolls back. We have the, the, the port that the service is operating on and then the sort of the analysis criteria. So I want to, to check um, and, and look at my metrics every, every 30 seconds. I think the, the kind of the cardinality that I'm running on my Prometheus is, is probably no greater than 30 seconds. Um, so you know, I, if I set that to five seconds, I'm not really gonna get, get anything better out of that. Um, the threshold is how many times does a metric check fail before we start instantiating the rollback? And then the, the weights. So originally, initially we wanna start with a 10%. 10% of traffic is going to, to be going through to the canary. And this is totally configurable. I could set it from one to 100%. And then I'm going to, to sort of increase it in 10% in, um, in blocks up until I reach a maximum weight of 80%. If I hit 80% of traffic going through my canary, I'm going to assume it's good and I'm going to put it into production. In order for Flagger to, to understand how, like what, what the, the criteria for success or, or fail is, you, you're generally going to be looking at a, a, a query. And, and in our instance, that's going to be a query, which is a Prometheus query. So I specify these metrics here and I'm saying, I've got a metric template called console requests. My threshold is if I've got 99% um, success rates to 1% errors, promote and um, my, my interval over a minute. I can, again, I can set some, some Discord alerts and things like that as well, uh, or Slack alerts. So the metrics are defined in another flagger configuration. And because I'm using Prometheus as my, my metric store, I just write a Prometheus query. If you were using uh, Datadog, or you were using um, any any of the other sort of providers that that Flagger supports, then you know you use whatever whatever you're just going to write your own query. So here I'm writing a sum. I'm getting the the Envoy cluster upstream requests. So this is a a metric which isn't actually coming direct from my application. It's coming from the the service mesh's data plane, Envoy in this instance, and and it's going to get the pod based on um, a replaceable that Flagger will, will pop into there. And where we're just checking some things like the, the Envoy cluster name to make sure that we're looking at the right, uh, the right metric. And then we're just checking the response code. So a response code that isn't a 500, we're gonna treat as a, as a success. And all we're doing is dividing that over the total requests times by 100. And that's gonna give us a, a rate between like zero and a hundred as a, as a kind of a percentage of, of success metrics. We could also look at duration because we're looking at just kind of like, has the request passed or failed? What we could also look at are things like, how long does it take for a request? So in the instance of, I could have introduced a bug, which just made the application really slow. Again, I can, I can define a metric template, which is using things like the, uh, the sort of the, the, the time-based histograms and stuff like that and look at things like my 99 percentiles to um it's it's 100 percent configurable which is like super super nice now flagger doesn't directly integrate with with console what flagger uses is the service mesh interface so flagger is actually writing service mesh interface which is interpreted by console and goes into its native configuration and that's really nice because it means that the sort of the flagger folks who are developing the tool can de develop against a kind of a common standard. And actually the, um, I don't know if it was you good folks directly, but, but I Kinvoke were um, instrumental in some of the setup of the early service mesh interface work. They actually built the first version of the Istio adapter for, for SMI. So super big props out to, to Kinvoke on that. So what's next? Well, next is routing. So Flagger is going to, to kind of configure those traffic splitters, but there's, there's more to it. There's, there's a couple of extra pieces of configuration that we, we need. What we actually need in terms of console configuration is the, the configuration around what our retry is going to look like. 
we need our service splitter, which kind of allows us to configure the, the division of traffic that goes between the canary and the, 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 the primary. And we need a, a service resolver. And a service resolver is, is a construct in terms of console, which allows you to kind of create, I suppose, virtual services for, for want of a, a better thing. And, and we can create those services based on a lookup in, in the service catalog. This configuration, like the service splitter, we don't define that. I'll show you what it looks like. The flag is creating those. You need to set up a retry and a service resolver. It's really straightforward config. Let's have a look at this. The service resolver first. So the service resolver is, as I say, think of it in terms of like a virtual service. So I have a virtual service called API, which contains a number of subsets. So I have a subset called API primary and a subset called API canary. Now, if I look at console, um, what I have as my service catalog. So here we can see our API service. And if I look at the instances, these are the pods. So I've got three instances of three pods running of my API. So in my, my service resolver, what I can say is, I can say, hey, for, for create me a virtual service for the API and create a subdivision. If the service ID contains API primary, put that into the API primary subset. If it doesn't contain API primary, then it's then it's canary, it's part of the canary. So at the moment, we only have the primaries running. When when we trip this in a second, you'll see the the canaries come into there. But this is this is automatic configuration and automatic routing that's going on inside of the service mesh. I don't need to reconfigure any load balances or Nginx or anything like that. This is service to service traffic. It's internal. And then I have my, my service router and my service router allows me to configure things like the, the number of retries. So we said that, you know, we want to kind of abstract the error message from the end user. So we're going to, we're going to retry because we're going to, if we have a bad instance, we will then retry it and hit the good instance setting a number of retries to five for the service API and the status codes that we constitute failure are going to be 500, 501, 502, 503. Now the service splitter, the service splitter, this is created by Flagger automatically. I, I never have to create this, but it looks like this. So we create the, the service splitter. We just define a, a weight. So what percentage of traffic do I want to go to the subset API canary of the service API, 10 and 90, et cetera. Flagger will continually keep um, provisioning these, updating that or, or um, downgrading it based on what the metrics end up looking like. We're nearly there. So Flagger, we do the deployment. It's going to continually monitor the situation. The key thing that we, we kind of want to look at is let's see how this works because it's going to be easier when you see, see the demo actually rolling. So if we go over to, to our workflow, what, this is the, the, the PR that I created earlier on. What I have is this, this approve step because we, we want to do a kind of a manual approval process. Um, don't have to. I think you kind of need to look at this sort of thing, which is based on the importance of the risk associated with your application. I think when you get really good and you've got a very sort of robust testing policy combined with a, a sort of a very robust monitoring and canary deployment, you can automated deploy a lot of your applications. But this is handy to have the approved job in this instance. There I go. I hit the button. Now you can still blame people, which is good. Get blame is a, is a terrible, terrible thing. There's no hiding anymore, which is really bad for me. So, so I'm doing my deployment now. So what Circle is going to be doing is it's just going to run that um, kubectl apply with my, my customized configuration. Now, I'm, um, I'm running everything here in, in Google, Google Cloud. I've got a cluster in GCP, um, three nodes, six CPUs. Uh, this is all run. We've set up uh, kubectl where we're authenticating against um, GCP to make sure that we um, we can get a kubectl, sorry, a, uh, a certificate and token that we can use to interact with the Kubernetes API. And then that goes. So that's, that's now been 
being deployed. Now, I'm looking at console here, and console is just giving me a dashboard of what's going on in my system. But immediately, you can see that we've now got API primary, and then this thing just called API. And this is my, my canary. So Flagger, what it actually does is the first time you make a deployment of, a, of an application, Flagger takes control of it. It makes a, a copy. So let me just okay, get pods. So it's going to make, um, it makes a copy of the deployment. So API is actually the original deployment. API primary is the copy that Flagger creates. So now that I've deployed API again, this is running, um, they're, they're both now coexisting in my, in my system. So let's go over to the Grafana dashboard and take a look at what's going on. And um, we are looking here. So we can see that Flagger has, um, has deployed everything. You can see that we've got the, the, the canaries and the primary running in production. This horrible yellow red line here was because everything was broken. But what you can start to see here is you can start to see now that we are um, we're, we're starting to go go back into a, a healthy a healthy phase. Um, this is, is starting to to go and deploy into into production. You're seeing this kind of crossover. Um, Flagger is is monitoring this and detecting that everything is is healthy, and um, is is slowly starting to increase the traffic. I'm just grepping the logs here, but you know you can see that every sort of thirty seconds the weights are getting increased from from the traffic there. This is going to run up to to a hundred percent, and eventually Flagger is going to flip the switch. It's going to promote the current canary into production, and it's going to. Um, remove the old the old primary it's basically going to switch them over in the instance that this wasn't um wasn't working correctly then you know obviously we would we would roll everything back and um and that again would ha would happen as a as a completely completely automated automated process so let's have a look at the the rollback process now Rather than kind of show you a sort of the, the, the live demo of the rollback process, which is, again, just looking at these charts, what I want to do is I want to show you the rollback process along with exactly the same deployment, which is not using a canary. So it's just a standard blue-green. So you can see the difference in what's, what's going on. So this is running. So we've got, we, we kick these deployments off at the same time. Now the blue green on the right is exactly what we did earlier, which was push our broken code into production. Now, if you look at the, the downstream response, the messages we're sending back to the end user, immediately we're sending errors back to the end user. You can see the API requests are, are completely failing. So this, this is a complete system outage in terms of this service. Now, exactly the same broken code exists on the left-hand side with the Canary deployment, but look at the difference. So look at the chart at the top, the response codes. Because we're using that retry and because we're only sending a percentage of traffic through to the, the, the Canary, the, the buggy version, there is a zero impact on our end users. Our end users are completely ignorant of the fact that we've just pushed junk into, into production. Flagger is monitoring this, and you can see by the flat line there that Flagger is like, well, this service is not healthy. It's, it's um, exhibiting errors, so it isn't increasing the canary steps. In fact, what now has happened is Flagger has completely rolled back that, that deployment. So again, the end user is, is completely unaware of that. We, you know, we're going to get, it's going to look a little bit small, and I apologize, but we can see, you know, the things here like the the error message that we would get back from from Flagger that we've got these failed checks and we've got the sort of the, that information coming in, so we can do the whole kind of GitOps thing. But it, it's it's just a really sort of powerful way and really really simple because once you've got this set up, I don't need to touch it again. It's just gonna kind of work like this forever. It gives me gives me as a as a developer a little bit more confidence. Like there's that old thing where people are like, oh, I don't want to deploy on a Friday. And 
And then you get half the people who are like adamant that you should never deploy on a Friday. And then there's half of people who are like, oh, you should have all of this like fantastic stuff and you should never be afraid to deploy on a Friday. It's true. You should never be afraid to deploy on a Friday. The reality is we're human. And, and the, the reality is we, we kind of work hard during the week and we want to enjoy our weekend. So there's, there, you know, there's a very good reason why we'd rather not deploy um, on a Friday. But, but the nice thing about being able to do this canary process is that if we deploy on a Friday and um, we break the, the application and we break the system, it's fine because we can just, we can just roll it automatically. It's just going to roll back. We can pick up the bugs on Monday morning and we can, we can find out what's going on. Our end users and our customers are, are completely, um, completely abstracted from that. Uh, we, we've got some source code here. There's, there's an example of how this is all set up um, on GKE. Um, and some, some Terraform config for setting it up. There's, there's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to sort of lie to you, but um, you know that it, it's one of those things. It's, it's, you take the first hit um, and then you're, you're, you're kind of good to reuse it. Um, the application, which I don't know. You know what? I think I actually wrote some different bugs into the app. I'm not even certain that um, I made it work. I'll be, I'll be amazed if I, if I did. Um, testing. Um, no, I did. I broke it. I've got to um, to set the uh, the correct endpoint, but it half worked. But that's that's nothing to do with Canary. That's that's just because I'm completely competent. And um, again, if we if we look at the dashboard here, you can see that the 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 kind of the, the, the everything's gone back to just those three pods running. And and that's it. I mean. It's a, it's a really nice, simple process and, and it works incredibly elegantly and, and massive props to, to Weaveworks for, for creating such a, such a brilliant tool. Um, and, and I think the key thing is that a lot of this wouldn't be possible without the ability that the service mesh can kind of intercept your traffic and you've got these great integrations with your CI, CD workflows and, and um, kind of the whole sort of modern approach around taking a sort of git flow and things that genuinely it's the sort of stuff that i i could only have dreamed of 10 10 years ago but thank you uh thank you so so much for uh putting up with us and if, if you do have any questions we'd be more than happy to answer them um hello thanks for the great presentation um how do you suggest working with canary uh, deployments if new version requires db migration that is not compatible with the old app version. So this is really, this is really difficult. And, and I think the answer is you, you can't. Um, but, but I think what you've got to do is you've got to, to look at the way that you, you, your DB structure changes. So for example, if you need to change a field from, let's say a, uh, a string to an integer or something that would cause like a, a completely breaking change that there's a sort of a question of whether you can do things in two steps. So should you change the type of a field or should you actually introduce a brand new field and look at migrating the existing data once you're, you're running in, in production? Um, I think you've got to kind of think about those things. I think with database migrations, it's okay to add tables. It's okay to add, add fields. It's not okay to take stuff away because what you have to have is you've got to have a situation where both versions of your application, the, the, the kind of the primary and the canary, can both safely read from, from the data store. And they, they, can, they can both do so you know, exactly the same time when they're running in production. So it's, it's very, very possible, but you've got to get a little bit creative about the way that you do your database migrations. And, and in some ways, some, some folks might, might decide that they'll do a a multiple phase thing, you, you deprecate a field as opposed to removing it. And then in a later release, you, you kind of do the removal. So it's, it's kind of that step by step version one to version two can share the same database. Version two to version three can share the same database. Version three and version one can't. And if, if you kind of follow those steps, then even if your canary deployment fails, your database migration, which has been already applied, can still work with the, the version one of the of the application, unless of course it's your database migration, which is the root of your problem. And then, in which case, um, 
blame the DBA. <laughs> It's quite right. a common problem, and actually, you have exactly the same situation when you're um, migrating API um, APIs. So you're changing the API fields. The key thing is you you can add, you can change types in certain instances. Um, you should never take away. Um, you just got to think about the key thing around making sure that the migration can sub support both versions of the both versions of the applications. Mm 